Hello everyone, my name is Omar Zarifi and I'm a developer at SideFX Software. Today I'll be presenting this masterclass dedicated to the new Whitewater system in Houdini 17. Just to give an outline of this presentation, I'll begin by introducing the Whitewater system and providing a quick overview of the major changes we've made to it in Houdini 17. We'll then look at the components of the system and discuss each in a little more detail. Finally, I'll do some examples to demonstrate the new Whitewater in action. So without further ado, let's begin by establishing the job of the Whitewater system, which is to enhance the look of a fluid animation with secondary effects that are difficult to capture with a single simulation, such as spray, foam, and bubbles. So here we have a beach where the Whitewater system was used to generate the foam on top of it with the intricate patterning. And this makes the scene look quite a bit more natural and realistic. Here's another example where splashes and spray were added on top of an ocean patch to really sell the energy of the system and the rich interactions that supposedly occur between the surface and the surrounding wind. Let's talk about the major changes we made to Whitewater in Houdini 17. To start off, it's a lot easier to control Whitewater amount now. With the previous iteration of our system, the user had to manually specify particle counts, but given the particle counts, it was really difficult to predict how much white water would actually be generated when you go out to render the scene. Uh, with Houdini 17, we've made it a lot more intuitive to think about the amount of white water, and the low-level task of managing particle counts is delegated to the solver. We've also added interparticle forces for the cohesive effect, and this endows the white water with much more natural fluid-like behavior, and also prevents them from clustering too closely into tight clumps. Discrete particle states and heart transitions between them have been eliminated in favor of depth attenuated forces. So the previous system classified each particle as one of bubbles, spray, or foam, and depending on the, the type of the particle, it would be driven by different forces. The problems occurred when uh, particles would constantly transition between these various states as they would cross the different thresholds. With the new system, we don't suffer from this problem because all of the forces are continuously attenuated by depth, so there is no hard transitioning to, uh, to cause issues. We've also added a mechanism to facilitate emergence of cellular form patterns. To this end, we've added repellents, which are special particles that are maintained by the solver, and these push nearby whitewater particles away and create the nice cellular form patterns on top of the liquid surface. Introduction of more sophisticated forces and interactions inevitably has an associated computational cost, and our improvements furthermore greatly increase the range of phenomena that can be simulated. So without any additional factors, this results in more combinations of parameters to test, as well as each combination taking longer to produce results. So to alleviate this issue, we've introduced the notion of whitewater scale that controls simulation resolution. So this enables artists to quickly iterate at the lower resolution to try out different combinations and fine tune the various settings. And then once they're happy with the overall look, they can crank up the resolution to get some more detail out of it. Finally, we did some work on rasterization and rendering. So to this end, our default setup also generates a gradient field for density, which is an approximation of the normals. And the new basic whitewater shader uses this information to render the foam, uh, complete with nice specular highlights that make it look a lot less flat than it did previously. So the components of the whitewater system are unchanged at a high level. You still have sourcing, uh, which is responsible for identifying the regions within the fluid where the whitewater should appear. And should you want to manually inject particles in certain areas, you would also do so here. The source is then used by the solver to actually birth particles and perform the simulation. And this is where most of the parameters that affect emergent whitewater behavior live. Finally, the results are imported back into SOPS where the user can tweak the settings to get the geometry ready for rendering. So let's talk about sourcing. The previous system used a node called Whitewater Source that took the particles from the fluid simulation and considered criteria such as acceleration, curvature, and vorticity to identify which ones should be emitting. And the output of this node was emission points that were then replicated by the solver. This was one of the major causes for the difficulty of controlling the amount of white water. So to address this issue, in Whitewater Source 2.0, we've moved to outputting an emission volume whose density corresponds to the probability of particles appearing at each voxel. And this makes it a lot easier for, to control the whitewater amount since the solver at runtime can determine how many particles should be generated given the emission volume that it's given. Aside from that, we've retained all of the same, all of the same criteria, namely acceleration, curvature, and vorticity.
for identifying actual regions where white water should appear. On the simulation side, the number of relevant nodes has been reduced to two. So now we have white water object 2.0, which is a container for the simulation object. And it's mainly unchanged. It just has a few more visualization options um, for the repellents, um, as well as the collision parameters now live on the object. So you can specify how the object interacts with the collision geometry around it. The Whitewater Solver has been completely revamped, and it's now actually responsible of birthing and killing particles, so there's no need for another Whitewater Emitter now. So the Whitewater Emitter node that was previously necessary is no longer required, and in fact, it's gone. So we've made a subtle but important change to the life cycle of particles. The particles are now birthed by the solver, which also takes care of aging them normally so that particles have an age attribute that stores the number of seconds that have elapsed since the particle was added to the simulation. However, the lifespan is no longer prescribed. The particles do have a life attribute, but this is more of a guide as to how long the particle should live as opposed to a heart constraint. So the particles are actually killed based on the value of their death chance point attribute. And the determinants of this dying probability are age and life so that older particles are more likely to die and depth so that if you want your bubbles to die quicker, then you can specify their aging rate to be higher so that they are more likely to die every time step. And uh, if you have erosion enabled, the uh, local density of particles is also considered when calculating death chance. And the major advantage of this new way of thinking is that particles no longer retain a memory of where they were born. So with the previous system, if you, for example, wanted a foam-only simulation, you would set your bubbles to have a very short lifespan. But the problem with this is that a lot of times the bubbles actually end up surfacing. But since they were born as bubbles, they will also die a lot quicker. Whereas in the new system, they don't retain memory of being born somewhere else. And the death chance is um, computed dynamically based only on its current surrounding environment. In case you're curious, this is a plot of uh, probability of a particle being eliminated from the simulation um, against this age. And the expected lifetime for this particle is five seconds. So we can see that it starts off very low and then ramps up and eventually tapers off into a constant. And the distribution of life spans for such a stochastic process is given here. The simulation was done with a million particles so that um, if you were to compute the mean of this distribution, it's still five seconds as expected. But we see that a lot of the particles greatly outlive uh, their expected lifespan if they're lucky as long as 40 seconds in this particular scenario. So let's talk about the various forces that the solver applies to the particles. So first we have uniform gravity, which applies the same acceleration to all particles. There is buoyancy that pushes particles in the opposite direction of gravity, and this is responsible for bubbles surfacing. And there's also advection, which carries the particles with the motion of the underlying fluid so that you get an illusion of coupling. And the first three forces here, which I'm going to call basic forces, were present in our previous solver as well. Uh, the bottom three here, however, are completely new. So we have density control, uh, which prevents particles from clustering too closely, and also gives your spray and splash nice surface tension effect, and really sells the idea that this is a fluid. Um, there's also depth control, which it pushes the particles toward the fluid surface, and you can use this to prevent particles from either submerging or being launched off the surface so that you have foam that really sticks to the surface of the liquid. And there is also a repulsion that the white water particles experience from nearby repellents, and this is actually the me mechanism that's responsible for giving rise to the cellular foam patterns on the surface. Here we have a comparison of the old solver versus the new one. And no effort was made here to make these match up, but we can see that um, with only basic forces enabled on a new solver, the results are fairly close to what you would get previously. So here we took the simulation, but enabled density control so that the particles are prevented from clumping up into tight streaks as in the top video here. You can see that the particles are applying repulsive forces between each other so that you get a much more uniform distribution of them throughout the domain. If you watch the top video closely here, which only has uh, de density control enabled, you can see that the foam constantly submerges, giving rise to these strange, disturbing-looking artifacts. 
Uh, in the bottom video here, we enabled uh, adhesion so that the particles stick to the surface much more faithfully. And the amount of submerging of particles under the surface is practically eliminated. Here we've also took the previous animation and enabled erosion on it so that the particles that are in areas of lower density have a higher chance of dying. And we can see in the bottom clip here that the, this results in much nicer looking or m more natural looking dissipation of the foam as it looks like it's evaporating inwards from the outside. So that covered, let's talk about repellents, which are special points that push nearby white water away, giving rise to the cellular foam pattern. And the solver is responsible for creating these repellents and maintaining their distribution, so it performs the necessary reseeding as it sees fit. And the particles are stored as points in a separate geometry called the repellents of the whitewater object, and the artist is, of course, free to manipulate these in any way they'd like. And unless a certain parameter called density threshold is enabled, they're actually completely unaffected by the white water, so that this is useful because you can temporarily turn off all particle emission so that you just have your repellents uh, in the geometry, and you can watch how they evolve as the simulation proceeds, and that gives you a nice idea of the kind of cellular pattern you can get. So the behavior of the repellents is largely dependent on their various point attributes which I have listed on this slide, and I'll quickly go through these here. So there is action and magnitude, which govern how strongly the, uh, the repellent particle is pushing nearby white water. Magnitude is meant to be more of a permanent property of the repellent, whereas action is a temporary modifier that's applied as a multiplier on top of the magnitude. So this is useful, for example, if you want to temporarily make certain repellents uh, weaker without, without forgetting their actual magnitude, so you could just set their action to be less than one. On top of that, there's also noise and phase, which control the shape of the repellent. So the repellents have a shape that ranges between perfectly spherical to quite oblong, so the value of noise actually controls how far away from spherical the repellent is. And for each noise value, there's also a continuous range of um, looks you can get depending on its phase parameter. Now with the fixed phase and noise, the shape of the repellent is going to remain static throughout the simulation, but you can also set its pulse, which will continuously vary the shape throughout the simulation. And depending on the magnitude of the pulse, um, you can get repellents that change their shape much more rapidly. And finally, there's radius, which, as the name suggests, controls the overall size of the repellent. Um, aside from these, there's also a pseudoparameter that doesn't actually affect dynamics, but is used by the solver to determine where reseeding needs to happen. And this particle is called crampedness. So you can visualize this particle or, you know, monitor it, but it doesn't really affect the behavior of whitewater with respect to repellents. And if you have mortal repellents enabled, which is an option that you may turn on, then the particles will also have two additional attributes called age and life. And these are fairly self-explanatory. Once a particle's age exceeds its life, it will be deleted. This video here shows the effect of noise and pulse on the shape of a repellent. We see as the noise increases, the particles become more and more oblong, whereas the lower noise values are quite close to being circular. And the pulse determines how fast the shape changes. So we see that if pulse is zero, then the shape is actually static. And for as you increase pulse in negative direction, then it will rotate a certain way and change shape in a certain direction. And the positive value will do the same, but just do it in the opposite direction. So now I have a few videos here to demonstrate the effect uh, repellents can have on a simulation. So here I've done the bare minimum you can do with enabling repellents, which is to enable them and have them all be the same. So all of the repellents here have the same radius and the same magnitude, and we can see that they are creating the empty wells everywhere, but all of the wells end up being the same size. So here we've gone a step further and uh, added some variation in the size and magnitude of these repellents. However, all of the, the, the distribution of all these attributes is uniform, so you get equally likely repellents of any size in the specified range. Now we've provided a custom radius distribution to the solver, and in particular, we've set it to be largely smaller ones and then a few larger ones here and there, and the solver correctly seeds them 
um, based on our specification. As we can see, most of them are pretty small. And then we have the larger ones scattered around. So here we've enabled thresholded seeding, which only uh, which signals to the whitewater solver to only put repellents in areas that already contain whitewater. As you can see, this uh, greatly reduces the erosion of the edge of the foam that is quite prevalent in the top clip here. And finally, we've added noise so that the shapes of the repellents are allowed to vary here. And here we're starting to get a more interesting looking foam structure as opposed to the circles of the previous simulations. And here's a comparison of results of, uh, the, of Whitewater Solver 1.0 and the results of the new solver. Uh, we can see that we have the freedom to get quite a different look from the new solver, whereas with the previous one, we were more or less restricted to the same streaky um, foam that you see here. So let's move on and talk about important rendering. Uh, so our default setup for the import network now has a wrangle that sets the density of particles based on their age as well as depth so that you can have particles that fade in instead of suddenly appearing as the whitewater solver gives birth to them. And also the depth so that particles that are further away from the surface can be made to be less visible, for example, so that you have spray that looks more diffuse than the thick foam on the surface. And these parameters are all controllable uh, using ramps. The inputs of this are then taken by the volume rasterize attributes node and uh, turned into a fog volume of density. And additionally, we're now computing the gradient of this volume, which is going to approximate a normal field for us that can be used by the basic white water shader to, uh, to generate the specular highlights and make the foam look more volumetric and wet. So here's an example of how that looks. And if you watch the front of the ship, you can see the specular shimmering. And this gives the white water a much wetter look than you would get if you didn't have the specular highlights enabled. And if I can go back to the simulation side of things here, this is uh, the same simulation that was, uh, that was performed at four different resolutions or uh, whitewater scales. And we can see that they all look basically the same. It's just that the lower resolution simulations have fewer particles on the top left, whereas the higher resolution ones have substantially more. And the one caveat of uh, whitewater scale not uh, affecting the overall behavior is that if you have uh, thresholded repellent seeding enabled, this only puts repellents in areas that already contain white water, which, and of course your density, your density approximations are gonna be quite different at different resolutions. So here we see two different uh, simulations with thresholded seeding enabled, and we can see that the repellents and the foam structure that gets generated is different, but the overall look is still quite similar. So let's shift gears now and do some examples. So with the first one here, I will just set up a simple simulation of a whirlpool and then add some bubbles on top of that with some custom seating. And this is just meant to familiarize us with the structure of a whitewater simulation and the various components of it. So let's begin. I'm going to put down a flip tank, which is found under the particle fluids shelf here. And this just creates a flat tank for us. And if we go ahead and simulate this, we see that nothing much changes as expected. So let's go back to the initial network where you specify the initial conditions as well as the size of the domain. So I'm going to go ahead and increase this to be 10 by 10. And let's raise the water level just a little bit. There we go. Now to make a whirlpool, I'm going to create a custom force field or a velocity field that I would like the fluid simulation to follow. So let's put down a box and make it the same size as our simulation domain. And this is gonna be mainly used to activate our velocity VDB. So let's call it velocity and I'm going to make this a vector volume and we'll use VDB activate to ensure that the voxels inside the box are activated. And I'm gonna turn off the value here so that 
we don't write anything. So we can use the volume velocity sop to create a vortex for us. So here we go. Let's add a vortex and let's set the radius to be five. And I want it to fall off at the outer edge, but inside I want it to be uh, to have full speed. So there we go. This should create a vortex for us, but we can't really see it right now. So let's use a velocity or a volume trail sop to trail points within this volume to see how this actually looks. So we see that this requires the points to trail and the velocity and the vector field, which we'll plug in. As for the actual points, we'll just We'll just use points from volume and hook it into the box. So that's a little too dense, so let's do 0 0.4. And we see now that we did in fact create a vortex and let's do it vect by time just so we're not fooling anybody with the length of these vectors. All right, that looks nice, however, this is not gonna end up pulling anything down, so what we actually want is an indent in the middle. So let's see if we can incorporate that in. So to this end, I'm gonna put down a volume VOP and hook up our velocity volume to it. And let's go in and try to incorporate it. So first thing I'll do is take a vector to float node. And I'm just going to use this to isolate the X and Z components of the current voxel location. This is because I don't really care about the Y coordinate. I want all of the downward force to be equal on every vertical slice. So let's convert that to um, vector 2. And like I said, I only care about the X and Z components. And we'll take the length of this vector. So let's add a parameter for the radius and I'll call it radius. And let's fit, let's remap the value of the length from zero to radius to be zero to one. So for this, we're gonna use fit range, hook up our length and for source max, I'm gonna use this radius parameter. So now this takes our length value and then maps it to be between 0 and 1. And from there, we're going to evaluate this at ramp parameter, which we will specify after. So we're going to call this the speed ramp. So this will take it as input 0 and 1, which is whatever refitted value of the, of the vector length is, and then give us a value of between 0 and 1, depending on what the ramp we specify is. And we just need a float ramp, so there we go. So now we need a parameter to actually specify maximum speed. So let's do that. and multiply the result of the ramp with the maximum speed. And this will be the actual amount of uh, negative vertical velocity that we want to add. So let's convert this to a vector. So we just want the y component, the other ones can stay at zero. And finally, we're gonna have to bind our velocity value. So let's bind velocity, which is the name of our vector field. This one's going to be used for input and this one for output. So finally, we just need to subtract from our input velocity, this new vector, get our output. And there we go. So let's set these parameters. For radius, let's use the same radius we used for the vortex, which is 5. Maximum speed, let's also use five. And likewise for the speed ramp, we're gonna 
do the same thing we had previously. So we had one on the left and one in the middle and zero on the right. Okay, so now if we plug this into volume trail, we should hopefully see it. Turns out that we need to specify that this is actually a vector. So let's try that. You can see that we're binding it as a vector. And let's subtract. And there we go. That looks like the expected result. Nice. So I'm just going to add a null now to get a convenient output location. And we can see that we have the velocity VDB here. We'll just call this out. And now let's go into our dotnet and import this field. So to this end, we're going to use the new volume source node. And for the sop path, let's just find the node we just called. So, and we're going to do a single operation on a vector volume. Our source volume was called velocity. And the target field that we want to affect is called vel. So this is the velocity field of the fluid. And since we only want to touch the velocities that are inside the fluid, let's mask this by the surface dot field, which happens to be a sign distance field. So I'm going to turn on this absolute sign distance field. And there we go. So the operation is currently set to add, which is going to actually run into problems if we continuously keep adding this as the simulation might eventually explode. So instead of doing that, let's set this to pull, which will simply pull the current values in this target field towards the ones that are inside of the source volume. And this avoids overshoot, uh, overshooting so that it's actually impossible to get unstable simulations in this manner. So we're going to enable the direction strength so that we are independently controlling the direction of the velocity. And let's plug this into the third input called volume velocity. So if we run this now, we should hopefully see the vortex. And there you go, as expected. And there we have our animation of the Whirlpool. Cool, so let's add white water to this. So we don't need to see this. So to create the white water setup for us, we'll use the shelf tool that's found under the same tab here. So click on the white water shelf tool, select our fluid, press enter, um, there we go. So this lands us inside of the dot net that performs the actual simulation. Let's exit out of that and check out the sourcing. So now would be a good time to describe how this node actually works. First, it looks at the voxels that are within the specified range up here, if it's enabled. And then it maps their speed from this range to 0, 1 range. And that value becomes the base emission value for that voxel. From there, it also computes curvature of the surface field, the acceleration and vorticity of the velocity field, and you will notice that each one of these has a range that gets mapped to 0, 1. And then the maximum of these three values get, gets multiplied by the actual base emission amount to get the final emission value for the voxel. And that's the basic method of operation, but you will also notice that there's all these um, remap options so you can get finer control over how the actual mapping between this range and um, the emission actually happens. So we actually noticed that with the default values, we're not getting any emission here for most of these frames. And that's fine. So let's just roll our own for this specific setup. So to begin, I'm just going to add a sphere. And that's a little too large. So let's reduce its size. And I'm going to add a box as well. And I'm going to Boolean subtract these just so I get a the lower half of the sphere. So I get just a lower hemisphere. So let's use Boolean subtract. And I'm going to subtract the box, which is offset by half a unit vertically from the sphere. 
and so I don't want the top cap there. So I'll just treat the uh, treat the sphere as a surface. And there we go. So now let's scatter some points on top of it. But before we do that, actually, let's move this uh, to a nicer location within the domain. We don't want it to be in the center. And we probably want it to be lower down. And we can kind of think of generating a volcano that's constantly emitting bubbles under the liquid. So let's use a transform SOP to translate this. And that looks like a better location. Let's go with that. So now we're going to scatter some points on top. And just so we know where, where we're headed, the wet water source actually also has an option to emit from extra sources so that this allows you to inject your own particles into the simulation. And the way this happens is that you give it particles, and each particle is supposed to have an emission attribute, which describes how much the particle should be emitting. And that emission attribute gets rasterized into a volume and added into the total emission based on whatever merge method you specify here. So for that reason, we're scattering some points. And since we need an emission attribute, let's use attribute noise to give us some varying attribute here. And let's call the attribute emit. And we need 1D noise. Let's make sure it's animated. So you'll notice there's a little button here. And if you click this, this will actually create the visualizer for you so you can see what this attributes, um, what's happening to this attribute in this node. And we see that the red values are the smaller range and the white is the middle of the range and the blue is going to be um, the lower values. And let's make sure it's using the 0, 1 range. And you see as we did that, it became a, lo a lot more dull. And the reason for this is that um, actually simplex noise is really uh, a lot of the a lot of the noise is actually located in the center of the range. So not to worry, we're going to use the remap noise uh, here to actually get a uniform distribution out of it. In fact, I'm going to increase the left side here so that we get less emission than than we would otherwise. And since this is a fairly small scale object here, we'll also reduce the element size. And that's how that looks. Cool. So the other attribute that is needed for a whitewater source to uh, rasterize the incoming points is p scale, which determines how far out the particle has influence. So let's create that. So I'm going to use an attribute create, p scale, and the value. Let's just use something reasonable. Okay, let's plug this into the second input. And if we visualize this, and extra sources, we can see that it created a little fog here where we had the points. Seems to be working fine, but looks kind of blurry. So let's decrease voxel size of the emission volume. And there we go. So right now it's doing a lot of the computations on the various fields of the fluid, which is why it's running a little slower. For this particular simulation, we only care about the emission that we're manually injecting. So one thing we can do is actually uh, manually rasterize these attributes into a volume, and we feed that to the whitewater solver. So let's put down a volume rasterize attributes node. Plug that into our points, and the attribute we want to rasterize is called emit. We use 0 0.05 for the voxel size, just like we did with the white water source, and normalize by clamped coverage so that we get a smooth fall off. And there we go. We see that we're getting identical results now. But you'll notice that the scrubbing is a lot faster since this is actually oblivious of all of the um, fluid um, fluid fields that need to be analyzed here. And the output is still an emit VDB, just like the whitewater source. So let's feed that into this out null. And let's exit out of here to see where that's actually being referenced. So 
Let's enter the Whitewater Sim, and we'll see that the shelf tool actually went ahead and set it up for us so that it has a reference to the volumes, which should contain the surface and the velocity field of the fluid. And it also is pointing towards an emission source somewhere. So if you follow that, we'll actually see that this is exactly the outnol that we recently redirected. So let's go back here and see what's happening. Uh, so let's just quickly add a bit of noise just so that the particles st start with some random velocities and just momentarily turn off all of these fancier options under, under the foam tab. Okay, let's run this and see what happens. Gonna go under the white water object and enable color particles by depth so that the bubbles now get colored red, and then as the depth increases, then increasingly the, color, the particle gets mapped to white. So we're seeing here that all of these particles are starting off at our source, but they're gravitating towards the right for some reason here. So what's happening there? Well, when the particles are born, they inherit their velocity from the fluid at the same location, and the multiplier applied to that inheritance is this velocity multiplier under the emission tab. So let's go ahead and set that to zero so that the particles start stationary. And if you play this now, you should hopefully see that it's reduced a little, but still it's noticeably going towards the right there. So what's happening? Well, despite the fact that they start out stationary, they're still being acted on by these other forces that are forcing, that are causing them to go to the right there. So this gives us a chance to inspect this forces tab here. Right at the top, we have the gravity, which is uniform acceleration that is applied to all particles within the simulation. But then you will notice after that that we have three sets of parameters, uh, namely for buoyancy, advection strength, and advection multiplier. And each one of these consists of a base value and then a ramp after it that attenuates the effect of the force based on the depth of the particle. And each, uh, each of these ramps, the center corresponds to the foam location as specified up here. And the horizontal range spans twice the depth range that you have, um, that you have set. So for example, the leftmost point here is actually 0 0.8 units below this, uh, this foam location, which is right at the surface, and the right endpoint pertains to all particles that are at least 0 0.8 units above the surface. So we can see here for buoyancy at least that all of the particles that are under the surface get a lot of effect of the buoyancy, whereas once you're out, it quickly falls off to zero. The force we're actually interested in here is advection. So advection, um, refers to the mechanism that carries these particles with the flow of the underlying fluid. So what we can do is, for example, set the left endpoint to zero so that all particles under the surface, or at least 0 0.8 units under the surface, get no effect, since the value of zero gets multiplied by the base of five. So if we were to run this simulation, we would see that all of these bubbles are unaffected by advection until they reach the surface. So that seems to have fixed our problem of the particles gravitating towards a certain direction. However, they also, the, the particles now look like they're not at all concerned with what the fluid's doing, which is a bit strange looking. So let's see if we can fix that. So let's reset this value back to 0.4 and instead worry about the multiplier. So the advection strength controls how closely the particles will follow the fluid velocity. But instead of following the fluid velocity, you can set it to follow a multiple of the fluid velocity. So for example, if I set this to 0.5, now the particles will be uh, advected by half the fluid velocity. And all particles are going to be advected uniformly because of this uh, constant want ramp. Here we go. We can see that the bubbles are nicely moved with the fluid. Um, but not too violently, but once it gets to the surface, 
It looks a little strange because the foam looks like it's lagging behind the liquid underneath. So if we play this at full speed, we see that we see that the liquid is moving a lot faster than foam on top of it. So we can fix this. Instead of uh, changing the global multiplier, which will reset to one, let's just make it so that the particles that are under the surface are affected less by advection, or are affected by slower advection than the ones at the surface. So now we get similar effect out of the bubbles, but once the particles surface, they'll start to follow the liquid more faithfully. And there you go, uh, basic simulation. So let's see if we can just do play around with these settings. Um, see what happens if we enable density control, which is which prevents particles from clustering too closely. So if we let this run now, we see that the particles are applying repulsive forces between each other. So that if we zoom in at the surface, we can see that we're getting a nicer uniform distribution out of them instead of a very very tight clump. So let's quickly check this out at full speed. Oh, not bad. You can see that these pink particles are kind of under the surface, and to prevent that, we can actually enable depth control, which will stick the particles to the surface once they get there. So let's see if this looks significantly different. Particles are clearly sticking a lot better to the surface now compared to the previous iteration. So let's run this to see how it looks. And there we go. Simple example of a whitewater simulation demonstrating how you can use these depth attenuated forces to get different effects for foam at different or white water at different depths. So let's shift gears and try our hand at a foam simulation on a beach. So let's go to the oceans tab and let's use this beach shelf tool, which will create a simple fluid simulation for us of a of waves constantly crashing onto a uh, collision geometry here, which is supposed to represent a beach. So let's exit out and see the setup that gets created here. We have a node for Beach Geo, which is responsible just for importing this collision geometry for us. And we have four nodes for the fluid simulation. So we have Beach Tank Initial, which specifies the initial conditions, but also continuously seeds waves so that you have constant incoming liquid washing up ashore. Uh, the DOPnet actually performs a simulation. And then we have these two nodes that are used for um, caching or rendering the fluid. There we go. And then the final three nodes pertain to the whitewater system. So we have the source, the sim, and the final import. We'll take a look at those shortly. So let's begin by looking at the beach geo and let's give ourselves a wider working base. So I'm going to set the Z scale of the transform to a two. And while we're here, let's change the color just so it's a little easier on the eyes. There we go. Uh, we see that the actual uh, fluid simulation didn't change its size, but we'll take care of that shortly. So if we go into Beach Tank Initial, we can take this ocean source node and uh, specify where the liquid gets seeded. So Let's increase the Z size to 40, and we see that the initial points have increased, but this is also linked to the it, simulation domain of the fluid, so that will get proper, uh, properly updated. Uh, now let's go into the simulation, actually, and we see that there's a pop effect by volumes here um, that is actually used to make sure that there's always waves coming in. Uh, but the velocity scale is set to 1.5. Let's set that to 1 just to get a calmer beach 
And this looks like a very coarse simulation at this point. You see that the particles are very um, coarsely separated. So let's decrease the particle se uh, separation to something a little finer. And there we go, that looks better. So instead of simulating this, I went ahead and cached it for us so that we don't have to wait for that. And if we take a look here, we see what's happening. We have the liquid constantly being pushed up the shore and then gravity pulling it back. So a fairly standard beach simulation. Uh, so let's look at the whitewater simulation that's being generated here as well. So let's enter the whitewater source and this is actually the exact same setup we saw in our previous example. I'm just going to go to the whitewater source and disable some of these. Let's just emit from acceleration for this one. And since this is a more energetic simulation than your usual one, we're going to increase the speed range to 4 to 8. So see how that looks. Yeah, it looks reasonable. And I happen to have also cached this out, so... There we go. Looks like an okay source for the solver to work with. So in here, the first thing I'll do is um, click the whitewater object, and we'll see that there's a physical tab up here where there's parameters for how the particle interacts with collision geometry. So in particular, I'm going to set the bounce forward to zero. And in this manner, we'll get more inelastic collisions so that the particles actually don't end up bouncing around like crazy off, this, off of the beach. And in the white water solver itself, let's uh, adjust the limits a bit. So we only care about the front of the beach. So let's just see if we can isolate that. And that looks like a decent domain size. And let's disable closed boundaries so that the white water can properly leave. And you'll notice here that this collision swap has been provided for us here. And this is important for simulations like this where you can possibly expect the foam to remain on top of the collision geometry as the liquid pulls back. In situations like that, if you don't have the collision geometry present, then the solver will think that the particles that were left ashore are spray since they're far away from the actual liquid body. But if you give it the collision geometry, then it will be able to correctly determine that these actually should be treated as foam. So let's switch over to this foam tab and adjust some of the other settings here. So let's make the repellents have a longer range of sizes and also strengths. And in, in addition, I'm going to change the radius distribution. So by default, if I have this disabled, then the actual repellents will be uniformly distributed in size in this range but I can actually control the distribution of them more finely by specifying this, um, the ramp here. So let's make most of them quite small and then we'll get a few large ones here and there. All right, that looks reasonable. And the last thing I'll do here is set the control range for depth control to be fairly large so that particles find it difficult to separate from the liquid. And we're going to set the off velocity angle to zero. So this parameter is useful for disabling adhesion for particles whose velocity vector is co-directional with, uh, with the surface normal so that you can have particles separating out of the leading edge of a um, wave, for example. In this particular scenario, we only care about getting the foam on the edge here, so we don't need to let that happen. Uh, and the last thing I'll do is that this has set a fairly large white water scale for us, so that would be a very low resolution simulation. Let's reduce that a bit. And likewise, I'm going to reduce the voxel size. So the voxel size is used for approximating particle density, and that particle density in turn is used for two different purposes. One is for emission limiting, and let's just reset emission amount to one. Uh, so lim limiting emission, if, if this is enabled, then the white water solver will look at the well, how much white water is already in a certain location, 
And if there's enough there already, then despite what the emission source is telling you, then it will not seed anymore. And this is very useful for preventing over emission, which can be problematic if you have density control enabled since all the particles are supposed to have mass and you can't have too many in, a, in the same spot. So that's one use of the um, density volume. The other use is for this erosion feature. So this uh, prevents particles in more dense regions from being killed or reduces their death chance, whereas the particles that are in more loosely distributed areas uh, get their death chance um, boosted as specified by these parameters. And the density estimates it uses come from the volume of this voxel size. So there we go. And at this point, we can run the simulation. Right off the bat, we see these points appearing, but they're not actually white water points. Those are repellent particles. And uh, you can be certain of this if you set uh, color particles by depth, for example. This will only color actual white water. And if you enable repellent visualization, you'll see that these repellent particles will, be, will become little spheres. Here we go, our first attempt at the white water simulation foam. So I went ahead and flip booked this for us. And it ends up looking like this. So not bad for a first attempt, but what I really want here is nice, smooth, um, leading edge emission. And I don't really care about what water appearing in the, from the incoming va waves. All right, so with that in mind, let's change our sourcing so that we only get emission at the leading edge. Let's go back into the whitewater source network here. And on the whitewater source, we're gonna disable acceleration now and enable curvature, which is useful for determining areas of high curvature, such as waves or the leading edge. So I found that the range of one to three of curvature works pretty well, and I am just going to reduce um, the speed range to be one to two, since the leading edge is actually gonna be fairly slow moving and it, I want it to be emitting despite that. And the other thing I'll do here is reduce our limit by depth range to something like that. So let's take a look at what that gives. Well, not what we want, turns out. Uh, let's go ahead and also reduce the emission size since we don't need it to be this large. Well, what's happening here? So we're getting a lot of spurious emission here from curvature, and the reason for this is that for, with high resolution simulations, you get more detail, but a lot of that detail manifests itself as high frequency noise when you're computing curvature. So the finer details all become areas of higher curvature that are going to be identified as possibly emitting by the whitewater source node. So to address this issue, the source is actually able to uh, filter the incoming surface. So just so we are able to see what the surface looks like, let's isolate it. And let's use VDB convert to change this into polygons. And there we go. So now instead of instead of using the actual volume itself, let's perform some filtering operations on it. So there's three operations here. There's dilate, smooth, and erode. What dilate does is expand um, expand the surface field by the specified number of voxels, and erode conversely shrinks it back. And these operations are useful for useful for filling in small little holes that appear, such as these here. And there's also smoothing, which gets rid of a lot of those high frequency details that are not actually desirable when we, you're trying to do curvature emission. So let's quickly enable these. Uh, and I'm gonna take the display flag off quickly here, just so I can set the parameters first. So let's take a look at that. So we see now that the fog is actually appearing at the leading edge and we're getting much nicer stuff. So it turns out that these filtering operations are actually quite effective at helping you isolate the leading edge. You will notice here that there's a pretty convenient option to output volumes, which 
you can use to make sure that the output also gets the surface and the velocity field that was used. And the, this is especially useful if you're performing filtering operations because now you can change the input of this and see the actual surface field that the source was seeing. And we'll see that it's lost a lot of its nice detail that we got from the high uh, resolution simulation, but that's nice because it gave us this nice leading edge. So I also have this cache out for us. Let's use that instead of recomputing. And all right, let's, one thing I'll do here first actually is reduce this emission amount just a bit and set the velocity multiplier to zero. If you recall here on the whitewater source, I set the depth to contain positive values, which means that we will get emission outside of the volume, out of the liquid volume that is. So to prevent those particles from just separating out, we'll set their velocity multiplier to zero so that they're just they'll just wait for the liquid that's behind them to catch up. And there we go. Actually, at this point, we might as well look into the import network here. So this starts out with the set density wrangle that has the display flag actually. And what this does is create a density attribute for us based on the particle's age and also based on the particle's depth. And the density value it gets out of each one of those criteria can be controlled by these parameters up here. So for example, in this particular case, we're only interested in uh, foam, so we don't need the depth range to be this large, so let's set this. And the bubbles, let's make them invisible if they're at least that much into the fluid. And you'll notice another convenient thing this does is set the point alpha, which is the transparency when you're visualizing it in the viewport so that the picture you get here is actually a fairly faithful representation of the volume that will get rasterized for you. So let's run the simulation and see how that looks. That's starting to look nice here. So here we have the flip book of that animation with the fluid particles underneath. And we see that indeed we're only emitting at the incoming edge. All right, let's switch gears and try our hand at a splash simulation. So here we have a simple fluid simulation, just um, some water energetically crashing against rocks. And we get some splashing, but we can probably do better by using the white water solver with it. So let's see if we can get nice, thick, viscous looking splashing from this fluid simulation. So here it is. Let's, um, let's apply the white water tool on it. So we're gonna select the fluid object. And there we go. So it created the uh, networks for us. Uh, one thing I'll do manually here is enter the splash sim network and copy all of this um, collision geometry from it and throw that into our new sim. There we go. So let's quickly look at the source and see what this has given us. Yeah, it looks, uh, it doesn't look bad. Let's just, let's just use vorticity though. Looks like a fine source to work with. That'll do. So let's go into our actual simulation network and on the whitewater solver, I'm going to adjust a few parameters to, uh, uh, to make this a better simulation. So let's start off by setting the whitewater scale to something higher since that would give us a lot of particles and we don't care about that at this point. Um, the other thing I will do here is set the bubbles aging rate to 100 so that all of the particles that end up inside of the liquid uh, get their death chance boosted by a lot so that we, we're not gonna end up with a lot of bubbles, which is fine because we're, we just wanna focus on the spray here. So that's good for now. And another thing I'd like to do actually is just to increase the limit sizes so that we get a little more vertical room to work with. <laughs> 
So let's go to the foam tab and adjust the settings here. So first of all, since this is a spray simulation, we're not gonna bother with repellents and actually the depth control is gonna be detrimental here. So let's go ahead and turn that off. And the density control is actually the most important um, determinant of how your spray is gonna look. So let's focus here. First of all, we don't care about particles inside of the fluid. So let's just start at zero and go to some value here. And for constraint stiffness, I'm going to increase that slightly. And if we enable variable stiffness, we'll see that it'll reveal this uh, hidden parameter for us, which allows us to control the stiffness of the density constraints for particles at different depths. And uh, another way you can use this is to actually make this depth range open at one or both endpoints. Uh, in particular, you will see that by default, all of the, both of the endpoints are actually at zero. So that particles that are under zero depth are actually unaffected and likewise for particles that are higher than 0 0.5 depth. But if I do this, for example, then I get all of the particles that are um, beyond 0 0.5 depth to be affected so that all spray particles are going to be uh, subjected to uh, density control and get nice uh, clumping effects to them. And now let's increase the neighborhood size so that we get some longer range forces propagating among our um, strands of fluid. And for tensile radius, so let's just increase that a bit. So these controls here are fairly important for the look of the surface tension you get. And uh, uh, increasing this tensile radius actually gives it a nicer distribution. So normally you would play around with this and find the settings that work for you. And there we go. So let's see how that looks. We see that we're getting nice strands of liquid here. And our splash actually looks even more fluid than the initial um, splashing we got from the flip simulation that we're using to uh, generate this on top of. So uh, let's see how this looks. Flip booked with all of the geometry present. And there we go. You'll notice here that some of these strands just break apart and uh, surface tension drives them to a more spherical shape as you would expect from a fluid. So let's say I'm happy with the look of that, but I also want some more diffuse mist to be, um, to stick around for us. So. Let's see if we can accomplish that. So let's go into a simulation network and what I'm gonna do is create a pop group node. And this is gonna be used to separate our um, white water into two different groups, namely spray and mist. So let's set the source group to just born. And just born is a special group that uh, white water particles are put in on the uh, frame that they're born. So this is useful if you want to do something like this, for example. So let's call these spray and preserve group so that we're not overriding it every time. And we're going to set it to be random. And let's just say 20% of the particles are going to be put into spray. So we're going to also use a different group here called mist. And this is going to be used to represent our, um, our more diffuse particles. So let's do that. And for this one, we're just going to um, they import everything that was just born and was not classified as spray. And there we go. So let's put these in and hook them up to the extra sources input of the solver. And another thing we can do is presumably these mist particles are a lot lighter, so it should be easier to launch them out. So let's add a wrangle to boost their initial velocity. So we'll do e times equals three. So this triples their initial velocity. Well, right now it triples all velocities of all particles at every time step. What we need to do is specify the group and we'll say just born that are not spray. So this is just born mist particles. And the last thing I wanna do here now is actually uh, make sure that the spray particles are properly affected by density control so that we still get that those nice liquid strands, but for the mist particles that are supposed to be diffused, they'll just fly around ballistically. So this is fairly easy to accomplish. So uh, let's add another wrangle and make it act on spray. And there's a special uh, point attribute called PBF stiffness, which you can use to uh, 
s set the stiffness of these density constraints on a per point basis. So this uh, actually works as a multiplier on top of whatever stiffness the solver specifies. So here I'm saying that apply full stiffness to spray particles, which is great. However, I don't want mist particles to get any uh, to get affected by density control at all. So if I set their PBF stiffness to zero, it will do exactly that for us. So let's do that and let's hook this up to the uh, particle forces and looks right. So the last thing I'll do is go into the whitewater solver and change the emission amount since we only have 20% of them being affected by density control. So let's just set the amount to some higher like 10. And we can run the simulation here. And as the simulation proceeds, we will it, see that it looks a, a bit strange because all of the mist particles are kind of blending in with the spray and kind of making it more difficult to see all of those strands that we saw previously. So actually, if we go into the import network, we can already see that it's a little easier with all of the alpha compositing. But we can go a step further and actually set the mist particles to be even less visible so that the spray, um, the more fluid like spray, is uh, highlighted a bit more. So let's add a attribute wrangle. And before we change anything, if I middle click on this, we'll see that it actually has groups called mist and spray, so it will retain all of the pop groups that you create in the DOPnet. So this wrangle, I want to only affect mist particles, and I'm going to say these are going to be my mist density. And for all mist particles, I'm going to change their density or multiply it by this uh, uh, D number so that it becomes uh, smaller than it is currently. And we'll do the same with alpha so that the viewport is uh, represents what we would see if we were to go up and rasterize this. So there we go. Let's set this to something a little more visible, 0.3, that sounds reasonable. And there we go. So we can, we still see the more liquid stuff here and the more diffuse spray is still visible, but it's a lot less visible than it was previously. So how does this look flip booked? Let's take a look. So there we go. All right, so let's see if we can do a little even more. And here I'd just like to highlight the fact that uh, white water simulation is just a particle system and you have the full arsenal of uh, particle operators to add your own custom forces or do whatever you'd like on top of anything that the solver does internally. Uh, so to demonstrate this, let's add pop drag. And this is going to be used to slow down the mist particles. So that looks good. Let's just make sure it's only applied to mist. And let's use a vex expression and I'll make the uh, make this drag more apparent as the particle ages. So let's multiply this by fitting up the age from zero to some max age that I'll worry about later. Do zero one. Cool, and for the max age itself, we'll set it to three so that once a particle is three seconds old, then it will fully, fully feel this drag force. So that's drag, but in addition to drag, let's also add a, um, some kind of force that simulates wind for us. So let's do pop force. And let's just make it something strong. And I'll also add a lot of noise to it. And once again, I want this only to affect mist. And like we did with the drag, let's make sure this is only active once particles age, so that once they're, as soon as they're born, they're more or less acting ballistically and just following the fluid velocity that was uh, given to them. So here, let's multiply force by... But here, let's use a different max age here. Let's do one second so that they become, um, they are subjected to wind before they are actually 
they feel the influence of the drag force. So let's add a merge node. Collect, connect these in and add them here. And the last thing I want to do is just to demonstrate how you could make um, use of the death chance and exploit that. So let's say that I want particles that are missed particles that are higher up uh, to uh, kind of just dissipate and become invisible. Um, so I can do that by boosting their death chance, actually. So let's add a final geometry wrangle. And once again, only act on missed, and we'll do we'll multiply their death chance by fitting up their y coordinate between some minimum and maximum. And if it's at minimum, we'll just leave the death chance unchanged, so multiplied by one, and at maximum, we'll um, just multiply it by some uh, value here that we'll specify below. For the range, let's do 0 to 20, and for the, for the multiplier, let's say 10. Cool, and I'm going to uh, hook this into the post solve so that we have the most up-to-date information about the particle's location that we're using here to determine the death chance modifier. And that's basically it. So if we run the simulation, we should get nice splashing from the spray particles as well as diffuse mist that is affected by wind and air drag. And also the particles that are higher up or further away from the ground plane here will get their death chance um, boosted so that we kind of just see them dissipate. So let's just go ahead and see this at full speed. And there we go. A final splash simulation with mist as well. So this concludes the masterclass on whitewater. I would like to thank you all for your attention and take care.